Hello, murderers and maybe monarchs. My name is Tibius Guy, and welcome back to the boss designs of Dark Souls 2. So, I'm not 100% sure what the last episode before this one will have been about. Probably a bunch of faffing about tying up loose ends all over Drang Lake. Maybe running around in some memories? Who knows? Uh, but whatever the case may be, I have made the executive decision, very executive, very, very brainy smart, to return to the first bit of DLC that we've already kind of made our way through some of, which is the Dragon's Sanctuary, where we managed to get our way back all the way down to, uh, well, to the lake of terrifying monsters that want to eat my face, where it turns out that I need, like, a special item in order to do a thing or open something. Uh, there. Hello. Hi. How are you doing? You have too many teeth. Oh, no. <laughs> okay. Okay, they lost interest. Good. I think. Yes. So it's this thing. I need a dragon stone, which I don't have. So, well, I guess we have to explore this place a bit more. The catacombs and crypts that were full of, like, those half-invisible ghost guys that annoyed the hell out of me. We did not explore those fully, because they were full of half-invisible ghost guys that annoyed the hell out of me. So I guess that'll be the next destination? And that's presumably a shortcut of some kind at some point. Anyway, you too! Hello, dead dudes. Would you care to step into the magic square? <laughs> I'm in range! You can hit me! I'm fully in range! No? <laughs> right, that one's locked by something. And then the broken staircase down here. And now... All of this... Battery. Off! Nope. Okay, can I get some tombs to de desecrate, please? Don't be a mimic. Nope, but a trap! Man, that dragon ring cannot take a hit, can it? Callista. Huh. Nice name. Oh, that's a cool ass cosplay right there. Oh, that is badass. Yeah, I don't think you can do much against that Callista, even with magic weapons and stuff. That's a cool character design cosplay. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. Hey! Thanks for the help. Like, that's a cool cosplay. I mean, come on. Hurrah for revenge, but trio ahead. Okay. Oh, I see. Could you all just please come over here? <laughs> or fall down. That also works for me. Now stop being invincible. Oh, I'm desecrating me some graves. Why are you still invulnerable? Oh, this one over there. There we are. Hello. Nice to meet you. Eternal Sanctum Key. Is that the one I need for the door up at the start? The sunken king erected the eternal sanctum to shelter Sin the dragon. The sanctum appears to be a solemn temple, but it is filled with devilish creatures that ensure no trespasser shall cause offense. Really, I hadn't noticed. And now I should be able to open this door. Yeah. Who's giving a solo? Oh, I guess she was. 
Oh, there's more than one in here. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. Uh -huh. Go away. Lovely singing voices. Not criticizing your performance. All right. I give my life, not for honor, but for you. In my time. Okay. Aha! More ladders. Free it's all to you, the trial to survive for the day. No, no! Leave my equipment alone! You acid spewing little freaks. Oh, bonfire. Uh huh. I don't. I, <laughs> long, open, exposed bridge. I'm not sure I trust that. What the hell? Oh. Oh, he's coming. Okay. It's like, it's my general experience that. Uh oh. Right, there was a long ladder there that I just climbed up a second ago. I give my life, not for honor, but for you. In my time, there'll be no one else. Give me my souls back. Anyway, he'll be back, surely. Yep, there he is. Oh! What the hell was that? I can't use Estus. Ahaha! <laughs> you clever little sneak! And he's gonna keep doing that to me, huh? Not that it matters. Whoo! Surely. Surely there must be a boss somewhere. Hey, nice taste in headgear, man. Looking good. Elevator, right? Yep, that's the magic square. That's the magic square right there. Nice. Cave of the dead. Good luck. Oh, no, I recognize those torches. Oh no. Oh god, this is gonna be a gutter area, isn't it? What the hell? How did that miss? Okay, so these statues try to pet petrify me then. And then there's poison, and then there's everything all at once, all at the same time. What? You're still alive? Oh, not the time up front gaming. <laughs> there we go. Gotcha. <laughs> <sighs> kind of doesn't seem like anything that's left down here is that dangerous. I mean, except for the petrification. Oh, God. How do I get out of here? Let's try not to get petrified in the process. No, I am not going so well. Oh, no. <laughs> you again? This really is gutter 2.0. Oh, yeah. Oh, you have got to be sh me. You! Well, that's awful. And a bit boring. Like, it's just some dudes. It's nice to have the heat taken off me. Still not dead. <laughs> Summoning Jesus Christ. Yes, I will summon Jesus. There he is. Okay. I'd better be able to win now. Like, no, I'm not... I'm not soloing a group of three. Literally normal-ass people.
Okay, that's one. Okay, now it's just this guy. There we go. <laughs> he has completed the cosplay. And I get a sunlight medal for my troubles. Well, that was a little bit bull. Yeah. Like, that was... Yeah. I gotta say, just running into, like, three normal-ass people and having that be a boss fight is a little on the weak side, to be honest. But it makes sense. Like, in terms of... In terms of the environmental storytelling of the area, yes, it makes sense to have a group of of um to have a have a group of grave robbers, but down here, like basically like tomb raiders, who are trying to rob the place of everything that's in it. Skirt of nameless troubadour to hide your ability despite its appearance. While troubadours can get by on their own through wily use of their arts, for the most part, they still might require a generous patron. This stunning arrangement of layered flowers and the skirt is designed to capture the attention of a candidate for the position. It makes perfect sense to have a group of grave robbers as a group of antagonists that you're dealing with, but the execution, which is just having three normal-ass dudes be here in various bits of kit and armor and stuff, is a little bit, little bit weak, I think. I I should have I should have jumped. I thought it was just gonna be like you just had to walk out and fall down. I didn't realize there was such a distance. Let me just ignore you all. Okay. We are back where it all went wrong. Okay, so. No! I am very slightly miffed at the moment. No, no, ah! Oh, God. Well, that's goodbye to 90,000 souls. Do I have something that resists petrification better? <sighs> Barely. Now where am I? I'm just back here? That that whole excursion, that whole area, that whole fight, all of that, just drops some loot. Like, it doesn't drop any... The dragon stone isn't down there. Didn't get a dragon stone, didn't get much of any meaningful anything. So that was all just, I guess, just a combat challenge. Okay. I'm not gonna lie, I feel a little jerked around here. Okay, let's get to the spike room. And God willing, some chest in there is gonna contain the dragon stone. Hey, hey they take damage now. Yeah, see how you like it. There it is. It was here the whole f time. Okay. All right. The dragon stone was just there. It was it was just there. Just there, right there in front of my face the entire time. I was actually going to feel a little bit bad about summoning three like, helpers to help me deal with that 
boss encounter. Air quotes, boss encounter, but I feel a lot better about it now. F that shit. In terms of character design too, the grave robbers are just wearing like normal ass gear. Like they're just wearing normal stuff that I could wear. One of them has Lucatil's gear on, like, or Lucatil's style of gear. And there's really nothing I can do with that in terms of a character design analysis. Okay, bridge please. Yes, good. Now then, give me something real, Dark Souls 2. Something to sink my teeth into. Okay, I should probably limit how much falling down I do. That looks like a fog door. Just gotta find a way down there. Might be time to equip the cat ring. You again? Well, hello. Sup? How you doing? <laughs> Hi, hello. I think I see you. <laughs> Good fight. Try jump attack. I'm not jumping over there. It will kill me. We know what happens when I try platforming. There's the source of the singing, it seems. Okay, I made it. Down here. All the way. Who do we have here? Benhard! My friend! Of course you're coming with me. He's everywhere. It's kind of creepy, actually. This goddamn better have to be- has to be the boss fight. Who the hell are you? Elena, the squalid queen. Whoa! So it's her handmaidens that we've been fighting. Oh, she really is squalid. Of course she has that. And Benhart is n doing her no damage whatsoever. Well, he's doing a little, I guess. Better than nothing. Oh, she has a lot of health. And she's a powerful... Ah, uh, skeletons. Poison skeletons, too, it looks like. Or golden something. Heck if I know. She's like a cover band of Nito. Oh, sh What the? Lord of D, huh? Well, you must have a very happy set of lovers. Hello! I ain't rotten for sh**, lady. What the She summoned a flash Velstad. In what universe is this remotely fair? Well, it's Dark Souls fair, I guess.
Mother of God, I hope she can't do that more than once. I'd like it if he took damage from her spells, too, but that would be too much to hope for, I guess. Ah! <laughs> All right. So what Elena is, I suppose, thematically, is that she's the decay around here. Like, at least in terms of what, what she visually and in terms of her mechanics seems to represent, it's decay and degradation and, you know, slow destruction over time. Uh, hey! <laughs> Jesus is back! <sighs> yeah, actually, Lunatic, I'll take the help. Just from you, though. I'm not summoning Ben Hart, then. If she's gonna summon a second, then I am, too. I should heal that damage up. Shall I? Well, there goes most of her health. Whoa, 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 whoa. My health is back. Ow! So she's quite cool as a character design because she's kind of a halfway point between rotted tree roots and rotting flesh. Which looks cool as to be honest. Oh no, 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 no! Go on, summon your damn Velstad. There she goes. Okay, I may have summoned an overpowered friend here. <laughs> anyway, that's a lot of rumbling. Oh! It opened. Let's have a look at this, though. Hello. Oh, good day to you, sir. Ah, uh, first her soul. First her soul. Soul of Elena, the squalid queen, who rests beside the slumbering dragon of the eternal sanctum. This child of dark accompanies the dragon, slowly amassing souls in anticipation of the coming day of vengeance. The wondrous soul of this augur of wrath can be used to create new, acquire new mirror souls or to create something of great worth. I was kind of hoping she'd summon Velstad again, though. That would have been fun with a, with a friend to help me out. So let's just look at this tableau that she was standing in front of, because... So, this is, this is a religious icon, and it's styled very much in the style of religious iconography such as you would find in the Catholic Church. And the iconography here could not possibly be any clearer either. The dragon rising up above, standing far above the petty humans, with another dragon supplicating at its side, and drakes in the sky as well, stand above as a protector guardian god, shining literal rays of light. You can see them carved into the stone there. Down on the faithful down below, and the lesser dragons, who bow in supplication and pray to it and speak about it and look up to it. We have here what seems to be a prophet. You can see these humans on their knees in prayer to the great dragon god. So this is a cult image. I mean, it's a religious image. It's a cult if it's a small group of people. But it communicates a certain worldview that whoever built this place had about dragons. Seeing dragons as saviors, gods, rulers, divinely ordained somehow. And isn't it interesting that we've already run into a dragon who held a prize, who held a place of worship at the dragon Airy. As above, so below.
Now the real fight begins. Fine work, but now the real fight. Is there another boss right after? Oh, that would be good. Try trio and short ally required ahead. Let's let's hit uh well, let's hit stray cell first actually. And let's hit uh Seldora to get the the lore on the on the queen. First, and maybe spend some souls in Medulla. Yeah, 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 shut up. Okay, let's see. There it is, the Wrathful Axe. Is there another one? Is there only one thing? Good. An armament forged from the soul of Elena, Child of Dark. With the abyss dissipated, the things that called it home were fragmented and scattered across the realm. Eventually, these pieces regained form in ways that hinted at humanity's true nature. And that would be Elena then, huh? Okay, so I have some help available if I want it, but first, let's try this on our own. Tail, therefore pointless. Okay, so this is the dragon then? Oh, it was lying on the ground over there. It spews fire and poison, I see. Whoa, that was a swift move. Sin, the slumbering dragon. Okay, so I can attack various bits of him. And he'll be weak to lightning, I'm sure. But he's not doing so hot. Okay, his face is not vulnerable. Whoa! Well, get down here then! Can't fight you when you're up in the air. Don't do any advantageous strategies that might help you win. That's unfair. Yorg's ring. I wonder if that's useful somehow. Ow. Is that bleed he's inflicting with fire? Uh oh. But I take it the communication here is you can't cut off his tail. Now this is more like it for a set of bosses. Like, that's more like it. Because look at this guy. Like, he has every reason to be pissed at me. Just for existing. Way to avoid that. Ow. There was a way to avoid that, though. Much like Sif, you can kind of... You can just wander under him. Oh, but he does have a way to counter that. Come on. Come at me. Come on. Oh, this is good. Oh, I like this. Ow. Don't get overconfident. I've got him low, but I don't have him dead. Don't get overconfident. Yeah, first try. First try. None of that magic bullshit that the queen was doing. None of that. Wow. Just me, two swords, and his face. Oh, hell yeah. That makes up for the Tomb Raiders. That makes up for it. The king erected a magnificent city, and the dragons slept soundly. 
until Sir Yorg disturbed it with a single great strike, and the dragon could bear its store of poison no longer. The rain of death toppled the city, but restored the dragon's purity. And then there was that ring I picked up, Yorg's ring. When Sir Yorg faced... The ring of Sir Yorg, who sought the blood of a dragon and invaded Shulva, can deflect spells. When Sir Yorg faced Sin, the slumbering dragon, he drew blood with a flash of his steel, but Sin responded by spewing forth the poison that had long brewed within him, blanketing the city in a miasmic cloud. What do we have here? Crown of the Sunken King. Hey, that's the title of the DLC! A faint heat lingers in the ancient crown. The king erected the eternal sanctum below the earth to worship the great dragon. Yeah, to worship them, as I said. But the towering bulwark crumbled with the city shortly after the dragon's awakening. But these were events of long ago, and today no one even remembers the king's name. <laughs> oh, I make that look good, don't I? Hey, is that one of the crowns that Vendrick mentioned? It kind of seems like it could be. Okay, uh, back to Seldora again. <laughs> to bother poor Ornifex. For lore. Okay. Soul of Sin. That's the only thing I can make out of it? Jorg's Spear. Spear wielded by Sir Yorick during his invasion of Sanctum City after his defeat of the Sunken King. Ah, so Yorick killed the Sunken King, huh? Sir Yorick ple pierced Sin, the slumbering dragon, with his spear to claim its blood. But Sin immediately awoke, spewing f a poisonous fog that blanketed the city in death, and Sir Yorick disappeared into the Eternal Sanctum. So those Drake Blood guys really like screwing things up for everyone, huh? We have found a crown. A crown that perhaps... Well, perhaps Vendrake was talking about these crowns. He saw, said something about seeking crowns. And so, well, probably before we call it a an episode, we should go and see what he, if it's anything has changed with him. Hey, uh, Vendrake, quick question. Was this one of the crowns? What do you see in the flames? Find the crowns and your own answers. The crowns hold the strength of lords from times long past. Seek adversity, as befits you, seeker of fire, coveter of the throne. I am no king. I am more fit to be a jester. I was unaware of my own blindness. We are feeble vessels, with feebler souls. We would cast aside the prop of life, only to face greater hardship. Are you another such fool, or something more? I fail to see your design, young moth. But I see very little these days. So, that was Elena, the Squalid Queen, followed rather distressingly immediately by Sin, the Slumbering Dragon. Were the opponents both of them, although I think we can all agree that I kicked Sin's ass seven ways from Sunday because I am just that good when I'm not fighting something that can cast spells at me. Uh, but exactly parsing out the story in that area and what happened and what any of that might mean in relation to, you know, the wider scope of Dark Souls 2 is fortunately not my problem. That is for future Sky to decide. And all I have to do is stand around here and admire just how good I look in a crown. Well, thank you very much, Paskine, and I see that you just had to fight two bosses in the same episode on this one. That's nice. You couldn't have... I don't know, run around and fallen down some holes and screamed some more so I could justify splitting this one up into two? <sighs> oh, very well then. 
So let's tackle these two in order, starting with Ilana, the Squalid Queen. And yes, Pascaline called her Elena a lot, but sometimes you read a word that looks familiar and then you assume that it is the familiar word and then you just forget to double check. Now, Elana presents an interesting conundrum because she is explicitly tied back to the lore of Dark Souls 1, specifically the DLC of Dark Souls 1. She is a child of the Abyss. According to her acts, when the Abyss was scattered across the realm, the pieces of it eventually regained form in ways that hinted at humanity's true nature. Which gives us a fairly straightforward reading of Ilana. She is a picture of humanity, a representation of at least part of what we are. And in this case, what we are is decay. Elana's character design is somewhere between a corpse and a fungus. Now, fungi are the great decomposers of nature. Their life cycles often depend on breaking down complex carbon compounds created by other living things. For example, fungi are some of the only organisms in nature that can fully break down dead trees, and so they are one of the primary decomposers in woodland areas. Shulva, the sanctuary city, is a broken ruin of an entirely forgotten kingdom. It is the corpse of a previous world order, and Elana is the fungus that is feeding on it and benefiting from the continued decay. And so in that way, humanity here embodies a kind of entropy, a kind of constant movement towards chaos and disorder, which juxtaposes nicely with the idea of the Age of Fire and the constant attempts to impose order instituted by the gods, people like King Gwyn, who live their lives struggling forever against the onset of decay promised by the Age of Dark. But the trouble I have with this reading of Ilana, at least for our purposes, is that it's a reading of Ilana kind of mostly in the context of Dark Souls 1. She's a child of the Abyss from Dark Souls 1, and the themes that she embodies in this reading are also children of Dark Souls 1, continuations of ideas that were put forth, I think, mostly in that game, and not so much in this one. So how do we fit Ilana into our reading of Dark Souls 2, which relies so heavily on questions of personal identity? Well, I suppose here, I would relate Ilana and the priestesses or handmaidens that serve her back to the Milfanito. Because there too you have a group of women whose lives are spent, well, mostly singing, but where the Milfanitos sing to try and soothe the dead and the residents of the dark, Ilana and her handmaidens rouse them. Their song is not a lullaby, but a call to arms. A call to vengeance. Vengeance for the broken state of Shulva, perhaps. Vengeance for the terrible crime that was done to Sin, who seems to be their god. Vengeance, perhaps, for the breaking of the abyss that led Alana to be where she is. Now, I have a sneaking suspicion, since the DLC all seems to be focused on fallen kingdoms and the crowns of long-dead kings, that the story of the DLC is making some kind of a point about kingship as it relates to the central quest of the game, which is to, you know, take the throne. And so the connection that's being drawn here, I suppose, is a connection between vengeance and decay. Ilana, the squalid queen, is queen only of a broken and crumbling ruin of a kingdom. Her soldiers are racked with poison, her lands are infested with bugs, and as monarch she does nothing to rebuild her kingdom because her entire identity has become warped around only the seeking of vengeance for past wrongs. She sits there in the deep and the dark, singing to her god, gathering souls for the day when her revenge will finally be exacted upon the world. And meanwhile, the kingdom decays. And that, I suppose, leads us on to the god of this decaying kingdom, the slumbering dragon, Sin. Who I beat on my first try, by the way. Just wanted to point that I did I did that on the first try, didn't need to summon anyone, didn't need any help, I didn't even die. Even one time, I wasn't even close to dying, except for all those times I was close to dying, because I beat him on the first try, and I just want some recognition for beating him on the first try, because I beat him on the first try. We spoke about dragons in the episode about well, the Guardian Dragon, because there wasn't really that much else to talk about when it came to that particular boss. And in that episode, I noted that dragons, pretty much wherever you find them, always embody or represent power. And this is never more true or more obvious than in the sunken city where before going to fight Sin, we get this giant carven tableau depicting him literally as a sun god, shining his rays of divine brilliance across the land and enlightening his small, puny human followers who bask in his glory. And he's not the only dragon to be worshipped this way. Up in the Airy, we met the ancient dragon with his legion of attendants and guardians protecting his high shelf from which he watches over the world and dispenses his wisdom. Now, Chandra tells us he is a false god, which only confirms that to a lot of people, a god is exactly what he is. 
And it is this godhood that ultimately becomes the downfall both of Sin and the city that he slumbers in. Because it is when Yorm and his Drake Blood Knights inflict a terrible wound on Sin that he releases all the poison that has built up inside of him and lays waste and ruin to the city that was erected in his glory. The city and the kingdom are in this way quite literally a reflection of him. When he is in good health, the city is glorious, and when he is wounded, it is brought to ruin. Now dragons, as I've said, embody power in various ways, which means they don't tie in necessarily directly with my identity reading. They aren't there to directly represent identities, I think. They are there for other characters to react against and in so doing reveal something about themselves and the world. And in this case, the people reacting against Sin are Yorg and the Drake Blood Knights, who hold Dragon Blood sacrosanct. They believe, according to the Drake Blood Greatsword, that by obtaining it, they can achieve a true understanding of life, transcending their own banal existence. Existence. What they seek is knowledge, specifically self-knowledge, an understanding of life, what it is, what their place is in it. They seek a release from uncertainty, they seek a release from being human, a release perhaps from the fear of death or from the anxiety of ignorance. In trying to drink the dragon's blood, they are in some ways trying to assume the dragon's identity, its divine identity. They are trying to become as gods. Hey, thank you very much for watching another episode of The Boss Designs of Dark Souls 2. If you enjoy this series, then I highly encourage you to hit the like, comment, and or subscribe buttons, and maybe also the bell icon in whatever combination or order that you feel like it. Because this series, more than most, relies on what's called engagement within the algorithm, i.e. people care enough about the thing to click on the buttons, and that shows the YouTube algorithm that this is a thing that should show to other people as well. Dark Souls 2 is a fairly old game, and a relatively unpopular one within its own series, so the algorithm kind of needs that extra little hint or boost in order to encourage it to show this series to more people than just the ones who happen to be subscribed to me. Speaking of which, if you're watching this video around the time that it's released, well, we record this series live on stream every once in a while, and then I go away for a while to edit all the footage I record into these episodes. Well, it's time to do that streaming again, so look forward to that happening on this channel in the near future. You'll be able to check the channel and see if a live stream has been scheduled. Anyway, if you want to support the channel more directly, than just clicking buttons on YouTube, then I do have a Patreon, a merchandise store, and a tip jar. If you want to use any of those, I'd be grateful for the help, and if not, that's completely okay as well. At the end of my videos, though, I do try to encourage people to, generally speaking, support the content that they enjoy with direct contributions of whatever they can, whenever they can. For online content creators, direct support from their audiences is literally magnitudes more powerful than relying on algorithms for advertising revenue. A little bit of pocket change of $1 donation can be quite literally the same as tens of thousands of views on certain videos, especially in these times when there's a global pandemic happening and advertisers are pulling their advertisement from all online platforms, causing the rates of advertisement revenue to plummet. It hasn't affected me very badly, thank God, but there are some online content creators who have lost as much as 50% of their ad revenue in these times just because of the way the global economy is contracting. So once again, if there is online content that you enjoy, please consider supporting it directly with contributions of whatever you can, whenever you can, because it matters so much more than you think. Anyway, the last thing I have to advertise is that I have a second channel where I do most of my Let's Plays and my streaming. Currently over there we're playing through Final Fantasy IX with occasional showings of Majora's Mask and a little bit of Legends of Runeterra as well, where I'm trying out decks that people send to. My second channel is also the place to go if you want to watch the unedited footage that forms the basis for this series. If you want to see all the times when I'm running around in a circle like an idiot not knowing where I'm supposed to go, or all the silly little mistakes that I cut out of the main episode, well that's over there as well. So like, comment, subscribe on that thing as well, because algorithm, and thank you very much for watching this video. And finally, here at the end, please remember to wash your hands.